Betty, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Here. So we've we've only got a By short. By the way, we got a lot of applause from Draper University students. So. It's always good to be uh, the professor and be able to grade your students too, right? <laughs> I, I, oh, that's the whole point. Yeah, so. <laughs> we don't um, have a grading system. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun here. Uh, as way of background, uh, I teach at MIT. Uh, I'm teaching a course in blockchain actually in the fall, but I've been in the world of finance my whole life, either at Goldman Sachs or running something called the Commodity Futures Trading Commission or being at the U.S. Treasury and things like that. But Tim Drafe versus Star here. And I thought, Tim, if we could start, rather than me introducing you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, but mostly your journey into not just Bitcoin, but the whole blockchain technology ecosystem. And then I've got some questions about sure. uh, your thoughts. So here's, here's how it all started. I was in Korea. I met this guy. And then he came to my office in Menlo Park. And I, um, and I sat down with him. And he said, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, there's this new game that everybody's playing. This is like 2003. And I said, what do you mean? Well, 40% of Korea is on this game. I think it was called Legend. And 40% and were, were playing this game. And he said, and you know, since I have to go to work during the day, I hired a guy to be my avatar and play the game for me while I was at work. He felt that. He had to perform at uh, at the the real the the terrestrial level and at the virtual level, and all of a sudden I started to think, "Wow, this is interesting. There are going to be there's going to be this virtual part of the world, and it's going to be much more potentially much more interesting and more uh, dynamic than the real world, than the terrestrial world." And then he went on and he said, "And I just bought my son." Uh, sword, and I thought, and I paid forty dollars for it, and I thought, was this a non sequitur or what? And he said, no, no, this is, this is uh, pixels on the screen, and uh, and I said, what do you? So you're paying forty dollars for your son to get pixels on the screen? And he said, yeah, and it does some things in the game, and so that's why yeah. we're doing it. And they've so I started to think they're since. they're using fiat money to buy. Uh, virtual goods. And then I thought, virtual money and virtual goods. And then I started to think, oh, this is going to be a big deal. So I, I participated in a couple of these gaming companies that had virtual money. And then finally, I ran into this guy um, at uh, uh, CoinLab. And at CoinLab, he said, uh, I, I can get you into Bitcoin. And I said, great. And then he said, um, and I, so I invested in him and his business. And then I also invested, I, I said, I'd like to buy some coins. And he said, OK, well, that's great. Um, and, and, and Bitcoin's at $6 each, but I think I can get it for you at $4 because we'll go mine it. And so that he took my money and, and created an ASIC that would uh, mine faster. And the ASIC, uh, and he bought the ASIC, and that was like in March, 2011, I think. And then uh, the ASIC didn't get delivered until about October. Meanwhile, the guys who made the ASIC for him were using it to mine, and Bitcoin went from about six dollars to thirty-six dollars during that time. And, uh, and so I thought, well, okay, well, but at least we finally got our chip and we, he's starting to mine. Then he said, okay, yeah, and then we're gonna store our Bitcoin in, this, in the biggest um, exchange there is, and it's called Mt. Gox. <laughs> and so then I did that, and then, um, and then Mt. Gox disappeared all the money, and I thought, okay, well, that, that must be the end of Bitcoin. But Bitcoin only dropped by about 15% on that day. And I thought, what? It should be gone. And I th so I wanted to dig in and find out why it just didn't disappear on this news. And I realized then that, no, it, it was that 
this Bitcoin is so important to so many people that they almost don't care if they're losing it in certain ways. They have to have it. And then my son started Boost, the accelerator for Bitcoin. And one of his entrepreneurs came up to me, he's, he was Argentinian, and he said, yeah, um, I've, my family's lost its fortune three times in the last, three times in my life, and I'm only 30 years old. And, and I said, oh my gosh. He said, yeah, well the government either takes the money or makes it worthless or whatever, and each time I've lost it. And so I'm gonna bring Bitcoin to our country. I don't care how volatile it is, it's gonna cha change the country. Could, could I ask you, you've, you've been uh, publicly reported to predict that Bitcoin prices would be, maybe go from the 64, 500 it is now to $250,000 by 2021. I wanna couple that with that you have. Yeah, when, when Bitcoin was at, oh, or go ahead, I just couple wanna it. couple it with some Nobel laureates like Paul Krugman and others and, and Joe Stiglitz and so forth, and even great investors like Warren Buffett, who would take the other side of that. They, and, and markets are always people that are gonna go long and short, mm -hmm. and, and Warren Buffett's certainly been more right than wrong, but I'm kinda curious uh, in the context of what some Nobel laureates and even Warren Buffett or Noriel Rabini has used as kinda harsh words about crypto and your prediction, so. So um, here's the way I look at it. Well, first, uh, you might wanna listen to me because when it was at 230, on air, I predicted that it would go to 10,000 in three years, and three years almost to the day, it hit 10,000. Tim, I'm okay. here listening to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you may wanna think, and I'm predicting 250,000 in four years, in 2022. So, um, so, I, I, look, those guys are wonderful. Warren Buffett, just so you get the idea, I have a lot of Bitcoin, so I really care about how it does. Warren Buffett has a lot of fiat currency. He has a lot of dollars. He doesn't like the fact that all of a sudden there's a, a better currency. And uh, he, he's going, wait, what about my money? And, and so, meanwhile, all this stuff is coming, and he's going, oh, wait, no, I want dollars. We should all work in dollars. This is what I have. Same thing with, uh, with Jamie Dimon. He's, he's going, we control all your dollars. We are a bank, and we control all of your dollars. And then he's starting to see like 1%, 2%, 5% of some of his big accounts leaving. And he's saying, whoa, where are you taking all that money? And they're saying, well, I'm going into a better currency and he's not able to provide that better currency, any kind of service around that better currency. Uh, so these guys are moving it into Coinbase or they're moving it into Binance or somewhere else. So, um, and economists, you know, they, they do like to try to project, but they're never really thinking, I mean, some are really extraordinary, but they tend to wanna, wanna put it into the box that they're already in. They're not thinking about all these entrepreneurs and what all these entrepreneurs are potentially doing with this new technology that makes for a better currency, a better way of life. Um, it's decentralized, it's cross-border, it's global, and it's frictionless. And so why would you want a currency that's tied to the whims of some government official or some central bank when you can have a currency that is global and open, and everybody sees it. So, um, I don't know if this, no, it's working. Um, I share your- It's okay, it's all, it only matters that mine is. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, who's, who's the little guy next to Draper, right? Um, but- uh, you, you, Do you want it? Go yeah. ahead. So, um, I'm trying to tease out though, uh, you've got a point of view, it's an important point of view that a lot of people wanna hear. But on the other side, there are economists, like the Bank of International Settlement just did this big report this past weekend and said, not so fast, um, centralized fiat currency has worked. It hasn't, I, I'm gonna agree with you, it hasn't worked perfectly. I mean, we, we've had a lot of crises, we've had a lot of bank runs, we've had a lot of failures, and central bankers don't get it right uh, on a regular basis. 
Um, but what they're saying is that right now the asset is too volatile in value. I'm just focusing on one thing, that to, to really be a true medium of exchange and a okay. unit of let, account. Let me hit the volatile thing. Okay, the way I look at it is when people say, isn't Bitcoin really volatile? I think, oh, yeah, this is great. Bitco one Bitcoin is still worth one Bitcoin. It's just all these other currencies are volatile as they disappear from view. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're in panic mode. This is panic mode. You're seeing it go way up, way down, way up, way down. It's panic mode because they see that there's a better way to do things. And that continues to happen. But to be adopted, to cross over, I think this is now working, but to, to be adopted and cross over, they'd say to have, uh, how many people in this room own Bitcoin, by the way? All right. Majority. Yeah, good, yeah, good crowd. How many of you get your wages or pay in Bitcoin? All right, it's starting, it's starting. Yeah. But that's what they're saying, is when will people start to have that adoption? And you're saying over time and transition, it will. Uh, can I change the subject? Where do you store your Bitcoin now? Yeah, yeah right. I'm, I'm sitting amongst a bunch of Russian hackers and and a bunch of very clever students, and this is what I'm asked, is where I'm gonna keep my Bitcoin. Here's what I, I do want everybody to do. Look, for those of you, about half of you don't have any Bitcoin, here's my recommendation, just so you know it and you feel this. I mean, the simple thing to do, go set up a Coinbase account and go you know, put some money into it and, and then buy some Bitcoin. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it kind of gives you the whole feeling that I get, which is go buy a ledger or one of these uh, like USB things, plug it in, download some cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or any, whatever else you want to download, and then pull it off and then look at it and then look up at that big bank building with all those fancy people with their suits on that are using your money and look back at your USB kind of ledger thing here and then look back at that bank and realize that you are going to have complete control over your money and you're not going to be throwing it into a bank where it gets manipulated and moved and whatever happens to it and run on or politically whipped or whatever. And suddenly you've got your money. And if, if you want to take that money to another country, you take it down. You plug that thing in, you take it right down. It's so simple and it's freeing. All of a sudden, it's like now we're starting to realize that there's still the geographic borders, but they're less important. And there is this global thing that's virtual that's on top of it all. And I actually think that now, I mean, you were a part of the government, governments are, are gonna need to, um, need to compete and they have to compete in this new way. Right now, hang on, right now, there's, a, there's the land-based government, and that's like the police and the fire and whatever. But then 80% of what a government does can be done in the blockchain. It can be done with, with smart contracts in the blockchain with Bitcoin. You can redistribute income. You can collect taxes. You can set up a driver's license. You can... You can do medical insurance. You can do all these things in a virtual way. And that pretty much shrinks government down and makes government compete across border. I have the third virtual residency card from Estonia. There are now 50,000 virtual residents of Estonia. They don't have to set foot in Estonia and they can still be a part of that country and they can be provided with government services. And now Malaysia is also a virtual government and, so, and Kazakhstan is starting a virtual government. You're gonna start seeing these governments compete for all of us. They are gonna be able to provide better health care insurance, better safety net, better pension, all these things and much more effectively, much more efficiently and cheaper. So why wouldn't we all kind of go with that? So let me come back to uh, 
Uh, I hope at Draper University you can get your diplomas on the blockchain at MIT. We do issue yep. diplomas on the blockchain. I know blockchain. who uses. I know who you use. We we saw the deal and we uh, turned it down. But it was still <laughs> well, still pretty impressive. Pretty and impressive. Great that you do it. Yeah, right. we do it with a different group that's a but, lot but cheaper. But we both MIT and Draper University. We, we do it diplomas. with a cheap group. We're sort of a startup I university. I see. You know, a little scrappier than MIT, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull you back to that you can put it on, uh, uh, on a card and you can take it down. But right now about 95% of Bitcoin trading is on custodial wallets on Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini and so forth. So that's not a particularly safe place. Um, in fact, would you agree wait, wait, it's not wait, safer wait, than wait, a bank? Wait, 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 wait. No, the banks are hacked constantly, and people are playing whack-a-mole trying to keep the hackers away Coinbase, from Wells Fargo. Coinbase is hacked constantly as well. But the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain has never been Agreed. hacked. Agreed. Knock on wood. Never been hacked. I'm so it's that. all a matter of kind of pounding away and keep, I mean, the, the banks are having a lot more time, a lot more trouble than the, the uh, crypto but, banks, but the I crypto But I see a bit wallets. of irony that we've moved to decentralization, which is the core of Satoshi's concept, and I will say Draper's concept. Um, but we're also, most of the public is allowing centralization at the crypto exchanges and not, not really getting protections when they put Oh, but, but there are all sorts of new decentralized exchanges out there now. So this is all starting to be de decentralized, too. I'm, I'm sure there will be a Coinbase decentralized. But would you agree that the centralized exchanges, we've just transferred one centralization to another centralization, and not for most, of course, you... Yes, you with, with a better currency, and one that you can move from country to country without any friction. And that is quite valuable, and one that you can um, that you can pay with much easier. I mean, I it's so much easier to send than going into a physical bank and take your cash out and put so, it in, or or going using a, even easier than using a credit card. So let me try to turn it to a world that you know so well, uh, and, and your family's been in venture capital since the beginning of venture capital. Your grandfather, your father, and so forth. Um, is a lot of disruption has gone on in the venture capital field. We had a wonderful panel earlier today where entrepreneurs are saying, hey, I can raise it through an angel or series A, series B, or I can do, it do an coin ICO. offering. Yeah. And so how do you see it changing the world of venture capital? And related to that, do investors, uh, particularly retail investors, uh, need some investor protections in this space. Maybe not exactly what's in this stock market, but some investor protections layered on this space. So two questions. Okay, so the first one is, um, I've been in venture capital long enough so that I embrace change, and I'm looking for change. And I got out in front of this. I knew something was happening. In fact, it's, it's the reason that I, um, part of the reason that I ended up going separate ways, not completely separate ways, but separate ways from my, the firm that I built over all that time, because I had the innovator's dilemma. I saw that finance was going to change. It was going to be either crowdfunding or angel list, or it's going to be something else. Well, it turns out it was Bitcoin and the ICO market. And, um, and now it's, uh, now in Q3, they raised more money from ICOs than they did from the venture community. Right. That gives these new young entrepreneurs a huge opportunity because what, what these ICOs are, are they're, they're a Kickstarter for societal transformation. They're like, you know, Kickstarter is like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm building this machine and if anybody wants to back me, they can put in the money and they'll, they'll get a machine if I can get the thing built. Same thing is true with the ICO market. And, and uh, with the ICO market, it's like, I have a vision for society. I know what society might like. It's a, it's a women's movement, or it's an eco movement, or it's a movement for better health, or whatever it is. 
those are the tokens that are now kind of coming to light and they're saying, hey, I believe in this. This is what I want to be a part of. I want the movement. I want these things well, to grow and then they'll become also, more valuable. It's also, I believe in this team of entrepreneurs, they're going to be able to build a file storage and that's called file coin or they're going to build something else, the better laundromat. Sure. And I'll buy a token because I'm betting on an entrepreneur. Sure. Team. Well, when I look at a new uh, ICO, I'm looking for a couple of things. One is, is there a built-in network or will there become a network? Because the bigger the network, the higher the price of the coin will rise. As Bitcoin continues to rise, I mean, to grow wide uh, and more people have wallets, the price of Bitcoin sure. will go up. Um, it's the it's, network it's, effect. It's a network it's, effect. It's, it's Metcalf's, Metcalf's law. law. Yeah, law you get rhythmic. It. Yeah. So that's the first thing I look for. And then the second thing I look for is after the ICO, is there a market for this coin? Who wants to buy it and why? And a lot of people haven't made that extra thought. Yeah, a lot of G the given that, given that extra there. thought to it, they just said, hey, there's money there, let's grab it. Um, I am, I am less concerned with protecting the widows and orphans because I think it's, first of all, the widows are generally older and not really, they're more like Warren Buffett. They don't really want anything to change and they're not trying to buy any they, you crypto. You don't think they need to be protected? I'm a widower, so I mean, I feel like. You feel like you need to be protected, protected you know, from I mean, all of these dangerous. Well, I don't know. I was yeah. at Goldman Sachs for 18 years, so. Right. Maybe a little different. <laughs> but I do believe, so, I do Okay, so, so I'm, and I look and I say, those laws, a lot of those laws are really dangerous because they keep these guys, 25 year olds, from taking a chance on their future and jumping in and, and putting some of their money behind a coin that might make them a future. Right now, right now, they come out of, they come out of your college, $200,000 in debt. You're fortunate they're at least MIT, they come out and they can actually get a job. But, you know, you talked about 99%. 99% of the colleges are providing them with really good ancient Greek skills. And then they come out and then it's like, whoa, you mean I have to work in a team? Yeah, but see, I'm going to take the other side. I think one of the great successes of America and of the developed economies around the globe is that we did layer investor protection laws on top of consumer protection laws. We said it's not enough to protect you against buying bad milk or a bad crib for your kid. We have to protect investors and I think issuers also benefited and the economy grew better from the laws from the 1930s. They're not perfect. There's a lot of mistakes that have been made. But overall, okay, and I you, think that and you think that helped. laws that were set up in the 1930s are relevant now? I think the principles, the basic public policy principles of saying there's an asymmetry about the entrepreneurial team knows a lot of information, investors, even widows should, and widowers should be able to take risk but to have some information, full and fair disclosure. Yes, I think that basic principle, and a second one is anti-fraud and anti-manipulation. So the concept that a, a stock exchange shouldn't front run, a crypto exchange shouldn't yeah, front run. Yeah, I'm okay with those two. I'm okay with those two. I'm not Ooh, okay. Well, well, that's good. I'm that's not good. okay with, I'm not okay with the, um, the idea that, uh, somehow we have to protect people from themselves. I, I think I, that's I, I a actually agree with you on that. I think that's a dangerous thing and it's and it's what creates very large sort of socialistic governments. And I like the idea of a government that is creates a great platform for everybody to participate equally. I mean fairly and equally because if you if everybody participates then they all have a pretty good shot at participating in this. This is going to be the biggest deal in the history of the universe. We have never seen a technology that, is, that can potentially affect this many trillion dollar industries. Never. 
And this is going to be it. And, and you want everybody to be able to participate. So if somehow you put a law in there that says you got to be a millionaire to participate, no, 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 oh, no. well, that's what the law does no, say. No, you no, know that's no, no, what no, it no, says. But, but Wait, it is what it says. First say that. No, it says, it says, no, 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 no. I'm going to, I'm okay. going to, no, oh, no, 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 I know where you're going. No, no, you know. I know where you're going. Let okay, say. I'll let you say it. Here, let me say it. Okay. Under this U.S. securities laws, there's a number of ways you can access capital. One way is what Tim just said through the accredited investor, Reg D, for those who are interested, roles accredited investor. But there are other ways to do it through crowdfunding and through traditional offerings. I do think that those basic, the two things we agreed on, the basic idea that you address the information asymmetry, that the entrepreneurial team has to share enough information so people can make their own decisions. Either lose money or make money, but address the information asymmetry and protect against fraud and manipulation, help markets. Those are the two principles. The report that you said Bitcoin's going to 250,000, but I'm going to remember that we at least agreed on those principles. I agree. The details need to be adapted. You know, what's, you know what's really interesting now is we've got all these cameras, all this video, and the video allows us the ability to make those all fair. So if we put video cameras in wherever anybody is, is pitching and, and we're receiving, and I, you know, if I do my entrepreneurial thing, we put a video camera in there, it should be kind of open. This is what we do at Meet the Drapers, by the way. It's, I, I have this show with my daughter and my father, and we interview entrepreneurs, and we allow people to, to pitch us, and the, and the audience, the viewers, can actually buy into that deal. And they do it through a crowdfunding thing. And that thing. addresses so, some in information some of asymmetry. It, some of it. Yeah, well, no, all of, all of the information asymmetry. But there's another part... And that is, um, I think there's a better way to do it, and that is to make everyone sophisticated investors. And if everyone's a sophisticated investor, then you've got a, a giant walled garden that might exclude a few of the widows, maybe some widowers, yeah. but a few of the wid widows. And, uh, and then it's a... Um, and then you've got a walled garden and everybody's taken care of. So okay. maybe there's a way to just train everybody in some simple way before they go on so, so and buy it, crypto. It, it, it's maybe an unfair question, but I want to ask you, you're such a successful venture capitalist, you always look back and say, well, where could I be wrong? Where could this, this investment, I want it to go up tenfold, but it might go to zero. If, if, if this is not adopted the way- Okay, I'm gonna made. let you in on a secret. And that is, I never care about what could go wrong. I, All I think about is how high is up? If this thing's successful, how big can it get? Because so many things can go wrong. And, you, and, you know, you can run out of money. You can not get along with your founder partner. You, the market can't evolve. You could be too early. There are, all of those things could possibly happen, and you could talk about it until you're blue in the face, but the only thing that matters to me is how high is up. But you also and, look and at the And can we transform so the world can, in this way? You, you look at the risk to see whether you can get a management team to uh, manage around the risk, to get, to get through that, that, that issue and that market constraint. Yeah, there's a I'm risk saying, what's associated. What's the big market constraint you see in Bitcoin, Ether, and the crypto world? What, what is it that you see? Is those you know, it's really interesting. It's like all the other transformational technologies. The, the resistance is only in fear. The resistance, so if you just plow through your fear, there is, this thing is going and it's going to completely transform the world, and we're going to have an awesome world. But the fear is constantly brought to light, whether the press writes about it or the government issues some proclamation or some other government issues a proclamation. Uh, it, it instills fear into people's heads, and if you can get the fear out of their heads and just go, no fear, we're going forward, that's usually the way the future goes. 
It's really amazing. You always think, think the worst. You're always worried about the worst. But the best things usually happen. And so it's just, in my mind, just a matter of time. And the more, the more fear we, we impose on these tokens and Bitcoin and the blockchain, the longer it will take. But it's happening. And, and if you mentioned Jamie Dimon, so let's bring it back to Jamie and JP Morgan. What do you think is going to be the, the, the thing that they will have to change the most or lose market share and somebody else is going to do better, faster, uh, you know, serve their clients better than JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs? Can you, can, you can just hear the bankers panicking right now. But what, just what feel line, the what's, panic what's in their the, voices. What's the line but here's of business that oh, is most well. Vulnerable. Here's what here's what always happens. First, the first thing that happens is they try to go, oh, it's nothing, and they did that. I mean, that's with with every new industry, every new technology comes along. The powers that be, the the incumbents, the status quo, all say it's nothing. Don't ignore the man behind the curtain. This is nothing, and then all of a sudden it's too big to get in there, you know, they're, they're going, oh my God, I got to face this thing. And then they all line up and they wrap their arms together and they say, we're not letting this happen. And then it keeps going. And then they say, okay, well, let's, let's go after, let's sue them. Or let's go get the government. There's another thing or, they do. They adopt the technology. I think. No, no, that's at the of, end. They will adopt no, this technology. No, this is the last thing they do. No, yeah, it's, like it's the after. Seven, seven it's after. Grief, right. Know. It's after the 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 press planting. They plant the press stories. They put out lawsuits. They create as much of a fuss as possible. They try to get their government friends involved. And then they go, oh God, this thing's happening. And then they go, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we get it? So then they either make or buy, as all, all great, great companies do. They go, am I gonna make this or am I gonna buy it? Am I gonna make a, uh, an exchange or am I gonna make a new kind of wallet? Am I gonna bring it in so my clients can use this? I know it's there. I know it's better than what we've got. I think we're all at that stage already. I think, that I think that's where we are. I think the large exchanges, whether it's NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, which is owned by ICE and Jeff Sprecher, who's a wonderful entrepreneur. I mean, I think the Goldman Sachs and so forth are kind of there. Fidelity and the asset management, they're kind of there in this next six or 18 months. He's kind of put, he has kind of put himself in a bind, whereas Which you're, he, Jamie. Jamie, but. But whereas Goldman Sachs didn't get into that bind, you know, they didn't put themselves out there saying, poo poo, this is a fraud, and poo poo, this is the. So Goldman Sachs has been able to jump in. If you've noticed, right, they're jumping right. in, they're doing something interesting. So, there. But as the incumbents are adopting this technology mm -hmm. and some of it, what do you think that means for the startups? Oh, it's awesome for the startups because some of them will be acquired. Some of them will make these banks their customers, make the, the trading partners their customers. And some of them will, um, will just build really big businesses on, on consumers. So I think they've got lots of choices. They can go build a big consumer business, which I always recommend or they can build a business that's sort of OEMs to banks, or they can come up with something very valuable to a bank and then say, so here. So it sounds like you think it's good for the blockchain ecosystem and Bitcoin and others to ensure a level playing field that incumbents and startups both can be in here. Well, that's what's great about these decentralized currencies. They are a level, level playing field. All of a sudden, it's leveled. The banks are saying, wait, I like it the way it was where it was a different level. <laughs> or we were up here and they were down here. Well, now it's like we've just leveled the playing field. I frankly think there's another thing. I think that startups can take more regulatory risks than incumbents. Incumbents are sort of, they have to beg for forgiveness where startups can sort of say, I can, uh, I mean. No, the they, other they, way around. Right. Yeah. Startups can beg for forgiveness and, and incumbents have to ask for permission. Right. So I think there's, and as. It's, and that, it, at least that was the excuse the banks were using in not taking crypto. 
It's interesting. I mean, Coinbase throwing off cash. Well, let's let's take another one. Let's uh, Coin Hako in Singapore throwing off cash like the best banking client you could ever dream of. No bank would take them. And it was really their way of saying, no, you can't participate wow. in our game. But, but, it's, but also, and, it's also they didn't want to take, with all respect, they didn't want to take the regulatory, the regulatory and risk. reputation risk of, of money laundering and terrorism finance and the like. So they, they have a different Okay, now we're talking, model. but we're talking about Singapore, and Singapore is the most business friendly. They, in fact, I don't know, they, they take about a third of all the ICOs were, were run through Singapore. I don't think it was the regulatory people that were telling them, not, don't not do this. Not maybe of the monetary authority of Singapore, but those banks are global banks, usually. So Yeah, that's possible, too. Yeah, so, that's possible. So, and, and the global, I found that tr there's a broad consensus amongst finance ministries about insuring against terrorism finance. I happen mm -hmm. to agree with that. I'm not, I don't know that their implementation is that successful, but. Yeah, as long as they're not using the idea of terrorism to, like, move their agenda. Like, oh, there are terrorists in wherever, Guam. Okay, let's go take over Guam. You know, I th I, I I'm always a little that, worried. Think, we kind of already right, have it. Yeah, I think the US we, we already yeah. kind of own it, but we don't. Yeah, yeah, okay, so if somebody says we want to go take over Guam, they, they could right. just go ahead and do it. And so by using the words terrorism, it spreads fear. It's dangerous. Oh, we got to protect you. It's their way of saying we're justifying the fact that you're paying half your GDP to us to tell you what to do. This is, we're talking about Guam. The government. Guam, yeah, Guam. Uh, so. No, but it's like, hey, we're protecting you, and it's all about protecting you. And I start thinking, well, wait, what are you really protecting me from? Yeah, I can see you and I probably don't have to share some views on I, I believe there is some social good in protecting against terrorism and and money laundering and so forth, but we, we should have some Oh, sure, it's a great, great thing to do if it's really terrorism. Right. But a, most of the time, it's a politician saying, oh, we've got to go here, you know. No, it, it, they happen to have oil and gold and, you know. <laughs> But it's, it's also, re reality check here is that most jurisdictions want to protect their tax base and they don't want tax evasion. Most jurisdictions don't want to have money laundering. And th so so it's, there is a, a consensus, but there's always been tax no, okay. havens and there's other okay, jurisdictions this is a, that want to compete. Now, when you talk about consensus, it's a consensus amongst the like the sector. dictator of China <laughs> and the President and all of Congress, or or worse, all of the bureaucracy, the and the and the dictator in wherever. I, I would and even the, say you want the other guy to pay his taxes. You probably really do want, you know, to, the 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 U.S. not hollow out its tax base. No, no, I. Oh, I think they can cut it a lot. That's different. That's that's what wherever we the result. But I think it's still in our best interest to pay our taxes. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, whatever they are. Yeah. 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 All right. So, so um, we, have, we have more agreement than you could imagine. Right. But I also think we should be very much activists and make our government compete with the other governments. It's the slowest to move because it's the biggest one. It's like. You know, when there's this new technology, it's like we should all be doing everything we can to make it so that you can do your government virtually. And, but the governments that are doing that, that are really going proactive on that, are like Malta and Gibraltar and, you know, all the small governments because they're little boats and they can go, hey, this is cool. I can get a billion Maltese. You know, there, we could have a billion virtual Maltese. Yeah, I think something else is going on and it's been classic around tax havens. Small population centers feel that they can afford 
to be light on taxes, maybe even zero taxes, to bring commerce in. It's harder when you have a big population center. It just there's some different well, but, motivations. I'm, I'm saying incentives. there's a big boat. The U.S. government's a huge boat, and getting it to change direction or to maybe throw some of the baggage off the <laughs> side is very difficult. Right. And that's a tough thing to do. And but they're about to go, we're about to go into this new wild renaissance where suddenly governments have to compete for us. They have, they have, to, they have to provide better virtual governance or else we'll go to another virtual government. So if I'm, if I'm allowed to ask because you've been associated with something recently that is about making governments smaller maybe, right? it's here in in California, California, the proposition Cal to split California Cal into three states. Cal3.com, baby. And so I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about that just here. Yeah, I mean, it, it just goes with my, my entire philosophy. People need to be empowered. They need to be represented in this country. They need to be better represented. We have a, uh, a, a group in Sacramento, and it's a, it's a growing group of people that are all a part of the bureaucracy that for the last 50 years have taken California from first in education down to 47th, and first as a place to do business down to 50th. We are the apparently the worst place to do business. All the CEOs want to move. And we, weirdly, with the best weather in the world, we are, we've gone to 50th in quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and for the first time ever, Five million Californians, Californians left and four million came in. So we have a net exodus of people. Something's very wrong. And the existing bureaucracy does not want this to change. And they're, they're set in their ways. They, spend, they used to spend 28% on infrastructure. Now they spend 3%. So our water is less safe. It could be cracking and breaking and whatever. But our, there are potholes in the roads, the grid's falling apart. And 3% of, of all of our taxes are going in to help that. And then, you know, with education going from first to 47th, in a place that, that imports this kind of entrepreneur, it's just, it's a crime. It's like we're getting the best entrepreneurs in the and world. So you, we're get, we got the worst if education. Three Californians. So three if Californians. there are three Californias, it clears the decks. It gives everybody a new. There are only a few things that have to be negotiated: um, where the water goes, how what happens to higher education, where the, how the prison deal is set up, and and there are three state compacts, and then and then you split up the debt and you're done, and all of a sudden you've got three new states that can be innovative, they can start new stuff, they can figure out how they're gonna work with Bitcoin and blockchain and ICOs. They can, they can move forward. All of these bureaucracies are moving back. And we need, like, and California used to be the state that was the most innovative, that set the tone for the rest of the country, and now when people say California does something, they go, God, why would I ever want to follow that lead? And so with three Californias, we're going to have three new leader states that do really cool things. So I wanted to give you that opportunity. Let me close with something about Silicon Valley and venture capital. There have been other panelists here yesterday and today who said, this is terrific. ICOs and Bitcoin is democratization of capital formation transformation transformative but it might actually lessen the centrality of silicon valley and the venture capital world here and do you one agree with that and two are you are right with that yeah i agree with it and i've been pushing for it uh, we have a net we have a global network so i'm actually happy that people are starting to recognize that they're really interesting technologies that are coming from all over the world. So whether it's one California or, or uh, what would you call the San Francisco-based California? Uh, Northern California. Northern California. Whether it's one California or Northern California, you're, you think this democratization and this Bitcoin, you're, you're not going to be like some 
big bank CEO and say, I'm afraid of it. It's all right that it will decentralize I think the world just gets way. better with it. I've, in fact, I've spent my entire career spreading venture capital and entrepreneurship around the world. So I, I'm feeling like this is, it, at long last, things are happening the way they right. should be. And you please, just you won't tell us where the Bitcoins are, but please tell us that they're not on some exchange hot wallet. <laughs> They're not. Look, I have figured it out. I am very happy with where they are. I'm, they're in very good hands. So you're trusting somebody. They're huh? in very good hands. <laughs> all right, all right. Terrific. So, um, yeah, this was fun. This is good. You know what's really interesting? It's just a thing. Okay, just so you guys know. The clock went from 15 down to zero, back up to 15. Now it's at nine. It has been, I, and then it was at six for a while. And then it's then it, yeah, like yeah. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. This was. <laughs> that was great. Tim, this was fun. Great was fun. fun. That was fun. All right.